Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. It's uh, now noon, and I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar, Clean Room Environmental Monitoring and Contamination Control. Uh, my name is Charlie Maher, and I'm with the ISP Boston Educational Programs Committee. And before we get started, I'm just gonna go through a couple housekeeping items. First of all, I'd like to thank our program sponsors, Boston Analytical, uh, DPS Group, ICQ Consultants, and Massey Bioservices for supporting this program. Next, uh, I'd like to uh, provide some information about how we're going to manage the question and answer session today. Uh, we use uh, the pigeonhole application, and you will have received a link to that in the invitation to today's uh, uh, webinar. Um, the passcode is ISPE SEP24, as uh, you see there. Also, that is provided as a link in the chat room of this webinar. So if you can't remember it, you just click on the link in your, your, um, your chat room and you can access uh, uh, Pigeonhole. That gives you the opportunity to uh, write in a question or uh, look at the questions that are there and then vote them up based on your interest in those so that we focus on the things that the, uh, the crowd is interested in. Um, and I just uh, offered uh, you to please uh, do that because it makes it more interesting to have a good interactive uh, uh, discussion about uh, you know, what's most interesting to you. Uh, since we have two speakers, uh, one thing I'd also ask is that you identify which speaker you'd like to have the question uh, directed towards. Um, I'd like to also ask you to think about uh, staying connected with ISPE. Uh, we have uh, social media uh, connections there on the screen. And with that, I'd like to uh, move on to introducing our speakers. So today, our speakers are going to be, uh, the first one will be uh, Michael Soper, and he is with Northwest Regional Sales Manager uh, for Centra, Cetra Systems Incorporated. He's one of the leading industry experts in room ventilation, differential pressure management, and mechanical systems for critical environments. His background includes innovation development, product management, and R&D at Schindler uh, Electric, uh, Phoenix Controls, and Cetra Systems. Our second speaker is going to be Jim Pullerain. Uh, he is a Senior Technical Service Manager for Stairs Corporation. He has been with Stairs Corporation for 20 years. His current technical focus is on microbial control in clean rooms and other critical environments. He has lectured in North America, Europe, Middle East, Asia, Latin America on issues related to cleaning and disinfection, microbial control, and clean room validation for disinfectants. So please join me in welcoming both Michael and Jim. All right. So let me just uh, turn over now to uh, our presenter to start the conversation. Thanks, Michael. Great, thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, everyone should be able to see my screen now. I'm gonna put this into, uh, into PowerPoint presenter mode. There we go. So that should be a full screen representation of, of that. So <clears throat> the topic that I'm gonna talk about today um, as the first of these two presentations is about comparing manual manometer testing to room pressure monitors. Um, at, at Cetra, we manage a lot of these spaces with, uh, with our products for, for, for customers. And in the field, when there's actually, uh, what's being done is uh, conducted validation testing for clean rooms. Sometimes the, the manometer that's being used for testing can differ from the, actual room pressure monitor device that's that's on the wall doing that continuous monitoring uh, 24 seven. So I'm gonna talk about those differences and how as uh, validation professionals and as end user customers, you can help to reconcile what those differences are. So um, there is none of the slides I'm gonna read except, <laughs> except this one. Uh, in certified environments, HVAC systems are an important part of managing the clean room air to minimize airborne contaminants, right? That's, that's the real goal. So maintaining a reliable and sufficient room differential pressure that keeps people safe and it keeps processes clean. But can you actually trust the readings that you see on a room pressure monitor and a building management system? Are they accurate? Can you trust that they're accurate? And then when you have validation professionals come in and you test those with a handheld manometer and you see that that differs from a wall-mounted unit, 
which ones do you believe? So uh, what I'm going to cover in the presentation material is we're going to get into some detail about the sensing technologies and help give you some guidance to reconcile the differences between um, uh, those two testing methods, one that's manual and one that's uh, wall mounted and continuous. So what we call as critical environments are really these types of spaces. Uh, it's not just clean rooms, but it's uh, clean room settings in healthcare, like operating rooms, compounding pharmacies where cancer medications are mixed and customized for uh, cancer patients, laboratories, fume hood labs, biosafety laboratories, uh, vivarium and animal holding areas for, uh, for research, and pharmaceutical manufacturing. So in all of these settings, maintaining a proper HVAC airflow and other environmental conditions are really a life safety concern. Customers have high consequence applications where the safety of personnel and the money protecting uh, 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 very large investments in, uh, in R&D are uh, very much on the line. So, the customer environment is oftentimes uh, regulated by codes and government standards, uh, FDA, ISO standards, uh, WHO standards. So a high value is placed on reliability and accuracy and quality. And that's why we have these types of, uh, of, of inspections that take place every six months in these spaces to, to make sure that they are operating properly. So an example of room differential pressure is, um, I'm gonna use an example of a pharmaceutical manufacturing. So these are almost always positive spaces um, for making sure that you're running um, anywhere from 0.03 inches to 0.06 inches of, of water column. Uh, you wanna make sure that the product that you're producing is uh, protected from any airborne contaminants or contaminants from the environment. So um, uh, in short, you're keeping the bad stuff out. So this is not only in pharmaceutical manufacturing, but also in uh, any type of clean room manufacturing for, uh, for devices. Um, lots of medical devices uh, fall into that category, compounding pharmacies and uh, biosafety labs. So what we've seen over time, maybe the last 15 years or so, is that permanently mounted differential pressure devices uh, have evolved. They really started with um, uh, sort of these manual gauges produced by, um, uh, by Dwyer. The Magna Helic is uh, probably a staple of the industry that everybody has, uh, it, that everybody is aware of. Um, <clears throat> it's gone through various vendors and technologies, uh, TSI, Triatech, um, Cetra, Siemens, CRC, these are some of the manufacturers that have produced these devices that may be present in your, in your facility today. And these are examples of um, permanently mounted devices and sensing technologies that are in place to, to continuously monitor that, that room and um, usually have some alarm thresholds that are gonna trigger alarms uh, if, if there is any type of incident that happens uh, in the environment that causes uh, a loss of pressure. So the technologies behind these uh, has, has um, not really evolved over the years. The presentation of the technology has evolved to bigger and larger displays and more clear uh, displays and other networking technologies. But at its core, um, these have been very reliable mechanical devices. Uh, the hot wire anemometer is a, um, uh, is a flow through sensor that is a very stable technology that's um, offered today. Uh, capacitive transducer is offered by a number of manufacturers. And now there is this tiny little sensor, that MEM sensor you're looking at is probably a half inch square. Um, that's the newest uh, type of sensing technology that's, that's in, the, in the marketplace. So again, this is not the handheld unit. These are the permanently mounted units that are on the wall and the sensing technologies that are um, basically built into these. So if you look at these wall units um, 
and you look at the you study more closely the accuracies and the drift qualities of these and the error uh, that that may be produced in these, uh, you you get a lot of variation with uh, with the results. Mechanical systems don't really have any specific ranges or accuracies or drift characteristics because they're designed to mount in the wall and just have a mechanical device that's going to measure what measure what that is. So you're not actually going to get a pressure value from that that you're going to be able to log or trend on over, over time. The next technology down is a hot wire anemometer. Um, that's a very good type of, of sensor. And uh, the differential pressure range of that can be about plus or minus uh, 0.2 inches of, uh, of water column, for example. There might be some variations from different manufacturers, but that's uh, one of the common ones in the industry. The accuracy of that is plus or minus 10% of the reading. And there are drift characteristics per year that um, largely depends on uh, how clean and how, how well maintained you, you keep those devices. Next is capacitive transducers. Um, they're also an excellent kind of device. There's um, a variation in the differential pressure ranges from those to very tight ranges around 0.05 to up to about um, one inch, uh, plus or minus one inch of water column. And then accuracy characteristics, any, anywhere from a quarter percent to 1% accuracy. And those also have drift characteristics that can be um, uh, you know, looked, at, looked at per year. Um, so these are excellent types of, uh, of devices, and uh, they, but, but they, they do require some maintenance and some recalibration that needs to, that needs to happen, uh, depending on what the application is, right? Some applications can be very tolerant of just the specifications and the drift characteristics. Other applications um, are more stringent and would require um, annual or semi-annual recalibration. And then on the MEMS side, uh, MEMS is Mechanical Electrical um, uh, Management System. So um, they're not necessarily accurate enough today, at least, that that technology isn't accurate enough for differential pressure. This can be used in uh, duct static pressure applications, but not necessarily differential pressure today. So that's an overview of wall-mounted technologies. So next, I'm going to talk about um, handheld devices that are used uh, basically when a validation professional comes in and is going to now check that space as part of the semi-annual uh, validation of that space. Um, and their goal is to produce a report for the end user that basically says um, your space is operating as, as designed. So they're going to validate that space, look to see what these uh, handheld devices are producing, and um, sometimes there can be problems that, that arise um, after those measurements. So all of these handheld devices are what I call industry workhorses for certification professionals. Very stable and reliable technology in place for many years, perhaps 25 years or more. So in wall-mounted devices, those have very tight accuracy characteristics that can be uh, plus or minus uh, 0 0.001 inches of water column. That's generally 10 or 20 times better than the, 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 the actual measurement that, that you need to, uh, to keep that, that room at. Handheld manometers use a hot wire anemometer technology, and uh, the general marketability of those uh, those products on the market is a little less accurate than the than the wall mounted technology. Still, very good technology, but um, not as accurate as um, uh, as most wall mounted units that I've seen in in my experience. So, if somebody is measuring with a handheld manometer and that differs from what is uh, shown on the wall, I might take a handheld measurement and I might see that this room is 0.042 inches of water column, for, for example, right? I look on the wall and I see that the display on the wall is showing 0.055 inches of water column. 
So how do I reconcile what those what those differences are? Which device wins? Which device it, do I do I really believe for the report that I'm going to produce? So um, we're going to talk a little bit about that in the in the next slide. So if I'm looking at the handheld device, have I inspected the airflow characteristics of the room? Do I know that I've placed the probe of that handheld in the right location? Or are there potentially drafts or uh, eddy currents of air that might be affecting that differential pressure measurement? Something to be very careful of. Have I inserted the probe far enough into the room? And is there no interference with the reference side of that where I'm actually holding that, holding that device, right? So those are things to watch out for if you're doing handheld measurements. On the other side with wall mounted units, um, does the facility manager or the person responsible for that clean room have a preventive maintenance schedule for those units? Are they maintaining them? Are they following the manufacturer's recommendations for either keeping sensors clean or keeping sensors calibrated? Um, when there are hot wire sensors involved, uh, have they been re-zeroed or has the transducer been re-zeroed or recalibrated? Is there a supply diffuser, which is airflow into the space that might be sort of fooling the pressure pickup port with any type of draft? Right. So um, those are things to consider when you're looking at both of those technologies, the handheld and the wall mounted. On this slide, I'm showing an operating room, which is, um, you know, it, it's it's a pretty much an ISO 8 clean room uh, type of environment. But you can see how busy an operating room gets when there are people and a patient and equipment in there. So any of this equipment could potentially be pushed up against the wall where there might be exhaust fans or other devices that are affecting this. So um, be aware, the, the bottom line is, is here, be aware of your environment and what might be contributing to any differences between um, how I'm measuring with a handheld and what the measurement and where those pressure pickup ports are for a wall mounted device. Here's an example of a hot wire sensor that I inspected uh, last year at a job site. So you can see sometimes um, when equipment isn't properly maintained, dust that might collect on this, um, uh, on this hot wire sensor can trick the device into thinking that there is less differential pressure in that space than, um, than, than there actually is. With um, a wall mounted device, um, a validation professional, a certification professional can actually uh, flip down the cover of this and follow the manufacturer's very simple instructions for um, removing the tubing to the transducer, hitting a, a, a couple of uh, buttons pressed for re-zeroing that sensor, and then re reconnecting those pressure ports and uh, without actually doing a full full span uh, recalibration of that, you can um, you know basically re-zero this sensor and then retest between the handheld and the and the wall mounted unit, see if there is an improvement in performance. It's very likely that there will be after re-zeroing that sensor. So the key takeaways for this presentation are really. Room pressure monitors have two underlying technologies, hot wire anemometry and um, capacitive based pressure transducing. Handheld manometers are, um, um, have specifications. Sometimes they're not well documented and you might need to inquire with that manufacturer. But if you're purchasing one of these units, make sure that you're paying the extra money for that greater accuracy because that will set you up to uh, be a better professional in the field. Um, know which one to believe. Uh, if a wall mounted unit is accurate and maintained, um, it was, it's in my opinion that that should win as far as the differential pressure measurement. But if steps are taken to ensure that you have an accurate and uh, well-maintained handheld device, then that can be very credible. And together, those two can help to set you up for um, being able to explain those differences 
to your uh, to your customers uh, when you're actually producing that report. So uh, that's the conclusion of my presentation. I think that uh, we might be moving over to maybe some question and answer. Right. So thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to call on uh, Jim actually to to uh, present his presentation at this point, if possible. Jim, are you online? I think you're on mute. No, I'm not. Okay, there you are. See ya. <laughs> All right. So uh, thanks again, Michael, and uh, handing over here to Jim to talk about uh, contamination control. All right, one of my favorite topics out there. Hopefully everyone can see the screen good. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the contamination control strategies in the industry today and present some uh, hopefully pretty interesting case studies to you. So the topics I'm going to cover a little bit on contamination control, a little bit on microbiology, and then the sources that we see in the clean rooms of typical contamination. Uh, some ideas on how to prevent that contamination from occurring and discuss a little bit about how it occurs in the room. And then I want to present some case studies on fungal spores and the clean room. So taking a deep, deeper dive into contamination control, why is that so important in the clean room industry? Well, you can just take a look at what we have going on right now during a pandemic in terms of vaccine production and therapeutic production out there of products uh, in the marketplace. So we want to be able to produce safe, pure, and efficacious drug products that are safe when you inject them into the patient or when the ta patient takes it orally. Uh, we obviously want to project, uh, prevent any types of, um, uh, let me minimize myself here, we want to prevent any types of microorganisms uh, from getting in the product in a process such as bacteria, mold, yeast, and viruses. And certainly, if any of those are objectionable, for example, like Aspergillus brasiliensis, a mold spore, we obviously want to prevent that from getting into the drug product. And uh, we want to meet the industry regulations. So Code of Federal Regulations, Draft Annex 1, Version 12, the FDA's aseptic processing guidelines, and USP guidelines as well. The idea is to have operational success and to make this safe, pure, efficacious drug product. So let's talk a little bit about the basic microbiology of this in the clean room. So one of the biggest issues that we run into is bacteria. Bacteria are very simple, single-celled organisms they have a little nucleoid in the middle of them, which is the uh, genetic material, the DNA. And they have typically a cell wall. And one of the keys to uh, bacteria that you'll see in the clean rooms is it gets spread. And the typical uh, reason that you would be spreading bacteria in the clean room is with your operators. So human beings shed millions of skin flakes and particles a day. And on these surfaces can live viable microorganisms. So that is your biggest source of contamination in the clean room. About 80 to 85 percent of it comes from you and me. Uh, the second biggest source is items that you bring into the clean room. So bags, boxes, intervention equipment, tools, any of that can potentially harbor microbes. And then another potential source is aging facilities. Things like the ductwork, the flooring, any of that as it ages can also be a potential source. And size does matter because as you see here, when we look at Bacillus uh, cereus on the tip of a pin, you'll notice how small it actually is microscopically. So bacterial spores are extremely small. You need a transmission electron microscope to actually see them. And fungal spores also are small, but not as small as your bacterial spores. This is an example of what I see in the industry a lot in terms of the fungal spores. So here we have some Aspergillus brasiliensis, these little white hair-like projections that you see here. These are my little conidia spores that can be spread around in the clean room and land on different surfaces like the wall and the floor and then get into the airflow stream 
and be dispersed on the many different surfaces in the, in the brim. This slide's important because it shows the hierarchy of kill of microorganisms in the clean rim. And I just want to call your attention here to the most difficult to kill organism in the room is the bacterial endospore. Some spores are going to be harder to kill than others, like Bacillus cereus, which is serious if you get it, Bacillus spiricus, Bacillus thuringiensis. Some spores are easier to kill, like Bacillus subtilis, Bacillus uh, uh, pumilus, Bacillus theropomophilus. And then the anaerobes, like Clostridium sporogenes, Clostridium difficile. And then organisms like Mycobacterium or TB, which can be an issue at state labs that are doing testing. Uh, you would need phenolic disinfectants or sporicides to kill that. And if you look at your sporicides like bleach, hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen peroxide peroxyacetic acid, those sporicidal chemistries are able to kill from bacterial spores on down the spectrum. And then we have quaternary ammonium compounds. They're able to kill many of your fungal spores on down the spectrum. And then alcohols, isopropanol and ethanol, can potentially kill from TB on down the spectrum. And then one of the big issues out there that we have today in the pandemic is SARS-CoV-2 virus, so the coronavirus. That actually falls into this bottom category of envelope viruses. So it's very, very easy to kill. Alcohol will very easily kill it as well. And phenols and quats and sporicides. So it's in the category of envelope viruses like HIV-1, herpes, hepatitis, uh, so very easy to kill, uh, similar to gram-positive cocci. That's one of the most common organisms in the room. So staph, micrococcus, enterococcus, streptococcus, very easy to kill those gram-positive cocci. So some of your most common sources of contamination in your clean room, what would those be? Well, it can be due to aging facilities, as I mentioned, that flooring, so that sealant in the floor breaks down over time and may need replacing because it makes the floor more and more porous. The more porous the floor, <clears throat> the more contamination risk you have. Another thing can be ductwork. Uh, if you have shedding of the ductwork in the clean room, that can be a source of contamination. Your number one source is people. We shed millions of skin flakes and particles a day and our behavior and actions in the clean room can directly influence the bio burden in that clean room. Material flow into the clean room. This is a big area. So anything you bring into that clean room, so if you have hammers, tools, intervention equipment, that needs to be decontaminated. I would normally recommend a sporicide or a VHP chamber, uh, or maybe even a UV light. Uh, because you have to address any potential bio burden on those pass through items into your room. Contamination comes from all of these sources. So facilities, aging facilities, uh, material transfer into the clean room, that's around 15% of the contamination. Operators, personnel, and visitors, that's a big source. Your processes, so are you making tablets? Are you making liquids? Uh, are you making pills? Are you working in a cold room for blood fractionation? Those are all ways in which uh, you may have an increase in particles and bio burden in the room. Uh, utilities, so when I talk about utilities, uh, I'm talking about the water you're using. I'm also talking about compressed gases, nitrogen, helium, argon, all potential sources of bio burden. And then, of course, equipment and where you place that equipment in a clean room is a big deal. So if you're blocking entry or return vents from the HEPA filtered air, that can create a contamination concern. Sometimes things like doors and some doors made of honeycomb can be a haven for fungal spores. So you have to consider that as well. These are some of the most common and effective products you can use to address bio burden in the room and concerns of contamination. So when we look at this, we have, uh, and I'll walk you through this, we have phenolic disinfectants, been around since 1800, very effective chemistry. 
We have quaternary ammonium compounds, and these are very good cleaners and effective microbial killers as well. And then we have sanitizers, ethanol, isopropanol at 70%, and 3% hydrogen peroxide. Those are all good examples of sanitizers. And there's a very robust list here of sporicides and sterilants. So there's bleach, which is sodium hypochlorite. Uh, there's also calcium hypochlorite, chlorine dioxide, hydrogen peroxide at 6%, uh, parasitic acid hydrogen peroxide blends, very common sporicide, aldehydes, ozone, which is very good for water decontamination, <clears throat> nitrogen dioxide, and of course, vaporized pro uh, hydrogen peroxide and vaporized parasitic acid as well. So this is our famous pyramid in the industry, and if you look at it, the most frequently used product in any room is at the bottom. That's your isopropanol, your uh, ethanol, and in the middle is what Thomas Arista from FDA calls the workhorse of your program, the phenolic or quaternary ammonium disinfectants. And up at the top is my nuclear weapon, my sporicide or sterilant. That's designed to kill everything in the room. So if I start at the bottom and go to the top of the pyramid, I increase in performance. If I start at the top and go to the bottom, I increase in the frequency of use. So you would use about four to five times as much alcohol as sporicide. So here's a case study that we published. And one of the things we want to look at is visible particles on surfaces and the best cleaning methods to remove them. So we highlighted this by using uh, a product like Bug Scout that fluoresces. And as you can see here, improper cleaning methods look like this. So this is like waxing your car. You wax on, wax off. That's not a very effective technique for removing particles or bio burden uh, or even dead microbes on a clean room surface. So what is an effective technique, you might ask? Unidirectional overlapping strokes by roughly two inches or 20%. As you can see here, we show you very clearly uh, by using that fluorescent dye that you can very easily remove it with proper uh, mopping and wiping techniques with those overlapping strokes by roughly two inches. Very effective. So let's discuss a few case studies here briefly. These are some of the most common molds and yeast that I see in the clean room. Up at the top are two of the most common which are aspergillus and penicillium. A couple of examples of recent case studies with aspergillus have been uh, one facility in California I worked with, which was using a high impingement spraying device to spray sporicide onto the walls and disinfectant. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, a facility in Rio de Janeiro where they had broken pipes above the ceiling and thus endemic black mold in the ceiling. Uh, the HVAC system, a couple of facilities I work with shut it down in the evening, which is what New England Compounding Pharmacy did. Not a good idea. The honeycomb doors and door kick plates are also a very big source of molds. So let's talk more about that. Here is that high impingement spraying device used at the clean room site in California. It was a large manufacturer. And as you can see here, it punched out holes through the wall all the way to the sheetrock. And then they put something on the walls that patched it that looked like spackle. The problem is, is then when they punched out the holes through the wall, it went all the way to the sheetrock and they had an endemic mold problem. Uh, and by the way, that site spent about one to $200 million trying to remediate the mold. Another big issue are door kick plates. Aspergillus can live behind the door kick plates or even in the door if it's made of honeycomb. And so the solution to this, the facility in California that had the problem with the aspergillus behind the door kick plates growing, they actually had to replace it with a solid stainless steel door. There was also a site in uh, Europe, the operator kept writing on all the surfaces with a black Sharpie marker that was not sterile. And the tip of the Sharpie marker was the source of the Aspergillus brasiliensis spores. So everything they wrote on was super contaminated with spores. This is a nice picture from the site in California. Using the high impingement spraying device I showed you 
back on this slide here. You can see it is super contaminated with Aspergillus and Stachybotrys. And that is a big mold remediation headache uh, and also a very expensive venture. One of the biggest sources I see are carts and especially cart wheels. So you should use a sporicidal wipe or a sporicide on the wheels. You could put the wipe on the floor and then rotate the wheel over the wipe to kill any spores. Or you could spray it down or immerse it, immerse the wheels in the sporicide for 10 to 15 minutes in a pass through. Another big thing is the handles. These handles are typically open underneath and spores can get in there and live. So you need to be sure to stress that on a routine basis with your sporicide. I just put this slide up to highlight the New England compounding pharmacy issues with mold. It was a very serious issue and it led to uh, fungal meningitis and several deaths. Here's a closer look at those mold spores. These are what we call the spiny spores from the aspergillus. So it's the mature phase of the spore. It gets down into my nooks and crannies here of the flooring and can be a real contamination issue. Now, another example is penicillium. I've run into this at a couple of sites. And as you can see here in this recent 483 from the FDA, uh, that using products like non-sterile disinfectants in a sterile area is a big issue because then you have to open up a root cause investigation, a CAPA, and potentially find the sources of, uh, or you have to find the reasoning uh, for why the expired product was used and answer questions such as, was it effective? Was it stable? Is there any data you can generate on that? And as you can see here in this 483, mold is a very big issue in the industry today. So penicillium, I was at a big biotech site uh, in North Carolina that had a big issue with penicillium. They had limits of 10 mold spores in the two ISO 7 cold rooms where they were doing vaccine production. And they had over 100 hits of penicillium in each room. So they were shut down when I went in there. This is a list of what all the engineers were looking at. So HEPA filters, duct work, they were doing active air sampling on top of the clean room. And when I went in there, I was asking about entry and exit procedures, decon procedures for anything coming in there. Had any construction been done on the sliding door in between the two rooms? And sure enough, the smoking gun, when they did their investigation, a couple months later, I heard, heard from them that sliding stainless steel door had uh, essentially paneling in it. Uh, that was contaminated with penicillium spores. And that was your source of the spores. This shows that paneling. So it was made of plywood. That plywood was super then contaminated uh, with, the, uh, with the penicillium spores and that plywood made up the door. We had some hits on the cooling coils in the room, but the actual smoking gun was the plywood that was inside of the door, which had been opened up for construction. Here's what the penicillium spores look like when they grow on a surface, the penicillium. And here's a close-up scanning electron micrograph of the penicillium. Uh, finally, a couple of parting uh, point, points here at the end on the molds. Acrimonium is also an issue in the industry. In this case study, you can see what the mold looks like on a plate. And I just wanna uh, emphasize here from this site in California, you really need to do a thorough investigation. And I think it's unrealistic to expect zero mold in the clean rooms. Periodically from time to time, you're gonna have mold hits and it's important to do a very thorough investigation to find the sources of molds, including if it's acrimonium. And you need to do testing to see how effective your products are. One of the things we learned here with phenolic disinfectants, some molds like catomium here are much, much more difficult to kill in five and 10 minutes than Aspergillus brasiliensis, which we would have never expected, but that's why you need to do the efficacy testing to see what you've got. So thank you for your time today and thank you ISPE, uh, Boston chapter for having me.
Uh, I wanted to just summarize, I covered contamination control, common bio burden in the clean room and where it comes from. And I covered some very interesting case studies uh, this afternoon. Thank you again. Hi, Jim, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, it makes you think about uh, what's in your clean room. <laughs> So um, we're going to shift over to our question and answer session, and I'm going to ask uh, uh, Michael to join us back. Thanks, Michael. Um, and we have some questions here, and I appreciate uh, that our audience has uh, voted up a couple of the questions as uh, uh, things that uh, you know, folks are interested in talking about, so we'll, we'll get to that in a second. I just remind everybody, uh, if you've um, had any questions during the presentations and you want to add to this uh, Q&A session, uh, click on the link in the chat, uh, which takes you to Pigeonhole and you can add your, your question in there or uh, vote up other questions that, uh, that are in the queue here. So, so let's uh, get right to it. Um, first of all, uh, let me just ask uh, Michael, what are the pros and cons between the different pressure measurement technologies? You uh, covered some of that in your, your presentation and I think that uh, uh, maybe a little bit more detail, I'm kind of interested in knowing what that heated uh, uh, um, anometer uh, was what's the technology inside of it? I think you're on mute. You're still mute. He's still muted. <laughs> okay, the, the organizer had to unmute me. <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah, so the pros and cons between different pressure measurement technologies. So the main ones that I talked about were hot wire anemometer and capacitive based transducers. Um, hot wire anemometers are generally a little bit more difficult to install because it's a through-the-wall uh, technology, and uh, they can uh, foul with um, uh, with with uh, contaminants from because it's actually a flow through a flow through technology. Um, but actually, uh, with with that said, when those are clean and calibrated, they're, they're actually one of the most um, uh, accurate in the industry. So just some caveats with, with that. The, um, uh, on the transducer side, the transducer does not have a flow through. It basically has a differential pressure measurement by, if you can think of it, the, just the gentle pressure on one side or, or another without any uh, uh, flow through technology. Um, those have specifications that actually show what the accuracy and the drift characteristics are. And if you buy a very, very good sensor, the, um, then that will perform for, uh, for years without, um, uh, without, without any maintenance. Uh, but then those sensors require some recalibration on some frequency, and, but that depends on the application too. So those are some of the pros and cons. Sounds like that not only is design, but maintenance is really important. Maintenance and calibration, ensuring your, yeah. your equipment is running uh, well over time. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Okay, let's take a look at the next question here. Um, so moving to Jim, how frequently is the source of contamination determined in an investigation? I would say overall that's a, well, first of all, that's a good question, but overall I would say, Charlie, that uh, it's pretty low percentage of the time, maybe 20, 25%. And part of the reason for that is when you collect that environmental monitoring data, it's not done real time. So you'll have a five to seven day lag period before, before you find out what's on those plates. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as a result of that, uh, it, you may need to go back and look at videotapes or uh, interview people that were working in the clean room at the time to potentially find what the source is. And I know I've been involved with a couple of studies, uh, for example, with Dinococcus, uh, where uh, it is very, very hard to find the sources of that one. So let me just ask a kind of a follow-on question. So, you know, everybody is very familiar with Steris as being, you know, a leading producer of, uh, of cleaning agents and so forth. Um, do you provide services to uh, support companies in doing investigations? Because, for instance, a lot of smaller companies may not have an on-staff microbiologist. Uh, how, how can you... Um, reach out for help and, and what's what's a, a, a resource that could be done um, to, to support that kind of activity? So what we have, Charlie, we have uh, a couple of things. We have a technical service group that I'm part of in Saint, based out of St. Louis, uh, where we do travel globally. 
uh, I would say a lot of our training comes down to on-site, uh, let's say PowerPoint training, so in-person training. Occasionally we get involved with the investigations, but if it's a really large investigation and uh, a very detailed thing, uh, normally we would probably recommend a consultant for that because we only you know, have a certain bandwidth. But if it's something on the smaller end, we might be able to help with that. We also have a contract lab for disinfectant coupon testing, and they can do some work on certification of BSL hoods. And they are actually located up in uh, Maple Grove, uh, Minnesota. That's AST Labs up there. Sounds great. Wow. So good resources there. And, and just to kind of, uh, you know, having uh, for small companies, an uh, ability to reach out um, and, you know, to other industry partners too, not just, uh, you know, the, you know, your, your firm, but uh, the approach of uh, getting help from outside to, you know, really drill down. Because it seems like an invest, if an investigation that isn't, doesn't find a source or is conclusive could lead to really big issues uh, kind of growing in, in a facility. So great. Um, let's see, take a ne the next question here uh, for Jim. Um, are warm and humid climates more of a concern uh, with fungal or bacterial spore growth? I would say absolutely, special, especially with fungus. So when I go to Puerto Rico or Singapore or Japan uh, or uh, Brazil is a good example that high, hot, humid climate, uh, especially like Rio, is really, really helpful for fungal spore growth. And you may see very high levels at clean room facilities there of fungal spores. It's a very common problem. And another big issue can be seasonal. So in the U.S. in the springtime and early summer, that hot, humid climate is really great for mold growth. Uh, when it comes to bacterial spores, if you're, for example, in Iowa or Nebraska or Illinois, I live in Illinois, uh, there's a lot of farmland and farming area, and a lot of your bacterial spores live in the ground, in the dirt, in the mud. And if you have uh, people working at your facility, coming on site, that's a great way that in those regions you can spread bacterial spores. Mm -hmm. Actually, that kind of makes me think, uh, Michael, if I could just ask you, um, do you see uh, regional or seasonal variations uh, with your differential pressure uh, measurements? Is that a factor um, over time that you've observed? Or is that uh, is it pretty much steady based on, is more affected by maintenance and those kinds of questions? Yeah, the um, uh, it's uh, the differential pressure and uh, you know general airflow characteristics of a space uh, really are independent of any differences in in climate. Uh, but depending on uh, you know sort of the, you know the sister part of that uh, uh, temperature and humidity, um, so you can create um, temperature and humidity and dew point conditions that can make it ripe for the kinds of things that Jim is, is, is talking about to grow. And then if your differential pressure and airflow characteristics in the room are also compromised, then um, that's just adding, adding on to the problems. So it's, it's all related. Uh, and, you know, it's especially in um, uh, in HVAC conditions and differential pressure, the thing that we're concerned about most is um, the amount of suspended airborne time that a particulate uh, might have, whether it's a viable or a non-viable particle, and uh, then the number of air changes per hour, the and uh, filter in filtration characteristics that are that are going on there. So. It's uh, it's it's all related, whether it's a, a, a an air suspended particle or whether it's a particle that's on a surface. Excellent. Well, thank you. Let's take a look at our next question here. All right. So this is a popular question. We've got five votes here. So uh, yeah. so Michael, uh, what uh, pressures would I be looking uh, to achieve in my rooms? Yeah. The rule of thumb for um, you know for for most situations is um, uh, 0 0.01 inches of water column, uh, and for a clean room that would be a positive condition or 2.5 pascals. Um, anything above that is also going to be excellent and provide you some buffer space to make sure that room is 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 always under a positive condition. 
uh, in you know real field kind of conditions with the high air flows that we see in clean rooms, they typically run 0.05 to 0.08 inches of, of water column. But um, once you start pushing your differential pressure that high, now you have uh, energy concerns, right? So um, I would encourage everybody to um, you know, think well above the 0.01 as a minimum standard, but don't go too high. Um, you know, have something in the middle, uh, maybe 0.05 or 0.06, that's going to uh, balance your energy needs as well. Yeah, along those lines, so an, another area, not just the clean room, but the uh, passages in and out of a clean room. So um, that's always kind of a, a, a an area for discussion when uh, people are designing and, and thinking about how they want to handle the the air ca the pressure cascade. Uh, yes. Could you maybe talk about that aspect of it? How, how do you advise um, uh, people who are doing design or tuning their their you know if they're doing a balance? How how they set up the uh, the pressure cascade through a uh, you know an entrance uh, point either mal or pal. Yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. So you you referred to this term uh, cascade, and uh, what Charlie's talking about there are basically uh, cascading pressure zones. So for example, um, you might be neutral outside of the clean room, and then you might have um, uh, the space outside the clean room to the ante room or the gowning room would be uh, 0.03 inches positive, for example. Then you want your gowning room to be um, negative so that your clean room is actually positive to the to the gown to the gowning room, right? So uh, the way to think of that is 0.06 in the clean room, 0.03 in the gowning room, and then neutral in the in in the hallway. So um, those are the numbers that I recommend for most uh, for most designs because I've seen most designers, um, you know, put those numbers on on paper. So those would be the static. I'm thinking about, uh, for instance, when you open in a let's say a PAL passageway, you open the out the C, the door from the CNC into the PAL, then you close that. Is there? How do you handle that that uh, that air pressure differential while the door is open, or is it the idea that once the door is closed, it quickly restores your differential pressure? Yeah, differential pressure uh, after a door open situation will recover almost almost in instantaneously. I mean, uh, a second or two uh, okay. in in most in most circumstances. Um, <clears throat> Unless you're driving an awful lot of airflow into that space, you are going to lose your differential pressure for the period of time that that, that, that door is open. I have seen some situations where um, uh, a customer was driving enough airflow into the space where they could maintain DP through an, op through an open door, um, <laughs> but now we're starting to get into that energy waste scenario. But right. um, uh, you know the bottom line is nobody should expect that differential pressure is going to be maintained uh, while the door is open. And in some cases, you might want to have uh, interlocking door scenarios, right? So you open the door to the uh, to the gowning room, and then the door to the clean room won't open until the gowning room door is closed. Excellent. Well, thanks for that. Those tips. Okay, we'll take a look at our next question. All right, so for uh, Michael again, um, uh, I operate pressurized rooms. Should I, oops, uh, should I service my room pressure monitors before validation inspection? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really good question. Um, I, I always recommend that people do this, um, but don't do it just before your validation inspection. Do it on the either the calibration or the cleaning frequency that is recommended by the, by the manufacturer. And then when your validation inspection uh, act actually happens, you'll be in the best position to, um, you know, have uh, no findings on that report and a nice clean report for you. Um, but sort of a sister question to this is, um, um, you know, should should I have um, uh, should I should I service those? There are um, you should refer to the to the um, uh, to the manufacturer's specifications on this, because in many cases you don't have to have a subcontractor come in to service those. Uh, there are maintenance procedures for re-zero or cleaning that can be done uh, by the facility staff or the clean room manager. So 
look in look into those and uh, maintain your devices sounds good yep all right i think we have time for one more question uh let's see what we have uh maybe bounce it over to jim okay great jim are bacterial spores harder to kill and inactivate than fungal spores i think we kind of touched on that but if you, do you have other insights on that yeah i would say definitely bacterial spores are harder to kill by quite a magnitude so some of the organisms I see that are hardest to kill in the clean rooms uh, would be Bacillus cereus, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, Penne bacillus, uh, Glyconolyticus, uh, and in terms of fungal spores, Catomium aspergillus. But far and away, bacterial spores are harder to kill and, and more of an issue if you get an outbreak of them. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we have time for one more. That was a pretty straightforward question here. All right. Uh, back to you, Jim. Uh, how would you determine the frequency of sporicidal application to control spores? I always That's recommend a, look at your environmental trending data over time, and mm -hmm. you need to take a close look at the frequency of hits of fungal and bacterial spores uh, in the clean room. And based on that frequency, you would adjust uh, the frequency of the sporicide. So for example, uh, I normally would tell customers to look at uh, using it at the end of each month, and then based on what their EM data shows, they can ratchet that up more frequently to bi-weekly or weekly, or they can move it out further to quarterly. Right. So what you're kind of pointing towards is a good program for uh, trending and analyzing that on a regular basis so that you feed that back into your, your cleaning uh, program. Absolutely. Now, kind, of, kind of an associated question is, you know, that comes up is, do we need, is there a need to change your cleaning agents? Uh, so that's a kind of a common thing that uh, on a certain basis, you use a ter certain detergent or a certain uh, cleaning agent and then shift over to another one. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, so you're asking, I guess, about rotation yeah. and uh, rotation since about 2005, 2000, uh, the whole stance in the industry changed. So back mm -hmm. before that, back in 1990, it used to be a lot of companies would use two disinfectants and a sporicide. That whole thought tr uh, process has changed because what we know is uh, resistance to disinfectants just does not occur in clean rooms. Uh, what we do have is we have spores. So with the spores, you need a sporicide. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the industry's really moved today to being one disinfectant that's robust and one sporicide. And that's what you see in the industry uh, throughout most of the globe today is one and one. Uh, it's not saying that you can't use two disinfectants still, you can, but uh, you might be wasting time and money with that where if you just have one really effective disinfectant, because disinfectants both clean and disinfect, uh, that's why with US EPA, you would get a claim as a one-step cleaner slash disinfectant with the product. Mm -hmm. Uh, that one is good along with the spore side, because if you don't have the spore side, you set yourself uh, up for a warning letter or a 483. Exactly. Well, I think that uh, gets us to the uh, very close to the top of the hour. So I, I thank you both uh, for joining us, uh, Jim and Michael. Uh, excellent okay. presentations and a great uh, conversation about you know how we can uh, ensure uh, through uh, equipment and uh, activities. Uh, that uh, we have uh, safe, uh, you know, production of drugs for our our, uh, our our patients. So thank you very much for that. So um, let me just uh, uh, say thank you also to uh, our our um, dedicated sponsors, Boston Analytical, DPS Group, ICQ Consultants, and Massey Bioservices. On behalf of the ISP Boston chapter and our presenters, thank you very much for joining us today, and have a great rest of the day. Take care. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, ISPU Boston. Mm -hmm. Thank you.